um, free my time. Sounds good. All right, it looks like it's recording. Um, so hello, my name is Alexa Hempel and I'm the Community Sustainability Liaison for the City of Kalamazoo through the My Healthy Climate Corps program. And I've been working on trying to get the reusable takeout containers off the ground. So I'm excited to have this session today to talk more about what that looks like for participating food establishments and hopefully get some folks on board. Yeah, I'm Chris Kajau. I'm the food supervisor for Kalamazoo County, and I'm here to talk about uh, food code requirements. Yeah. My name is Justin Gish. I'm the sustainability planner. I work with Alexa. I'm here to support Alexa on this. And my name is Jessica Thompson. I'm the owner of the Joyful Shop, which is Michigan's first zero waste and retail shop. So we're very excited to be a partner in this program. And I'm Natasha Gaffer. I'm CEO of Forever Wear, a reuse service provider um, that gets businesses up and running with reusables. Hello, welcome. <laughs> Sorry. Hello, everyone. Um, so our agenda for this meeting is first we'll talk about uh, why we're interested in reusable takeout containers for Kalamazoo. Then we'll have Natasha talk about what Forever Wear is and answer some questions on that. And then we'll have some time for how the city and how Jess can be joyful are planning on supporting participating businesses. And then we'll have Chris talk about the health department uh, variance information. So first, um, why reusables? Uh, the big picture here is that the United States uh, added 830,000 tons of plastic food containers to landfills just in the year 2018. And that equates to roughly the weight of 400,000 cars for comparison. So quite a bit of, of plastic food containers. And we would love to help eliminate that and get some more reusable items um, into circulation. So knowing those numbers, we did a survey of Kalamazoo residents to understand um, people's takeout uh, behaviors and interest in this program. And we gathered over 1,100 responses um, from folks, which is roughly one and a half percent of Kalamazoo's population, which is pretty good for a survey that was only live for about seven or eight weeks. And so from those responses, we found that 91% of those folks eat out at least one time per week. And 66% said that they take home containers at least half of the time. So this is good news for us in looking at reasonable takeout containers. So here's some more information about what they had said as well. 34% uh, of the respondents were interested in trying a new food establishment if they offered reusable takeout containers, which is pretty exciting. Um, another part of the survey was we asked what material was preferred for the containers and steel came out on top, which is why we chose to um, partner with Natasha from Foreverwear as her containers are steel. And then 59% of the respondents are interested in participating if there is associated cost, and 83% were interested in participating if it were free. And this program kind of falls right in the middle of those two things, which Natasha will talk more about. And so gathering those, those responses, putting it all together, I did some quick math and found that we could save uh, 30,000 disposable containers from landfills per year if only half of our respondents, which is 550 people or less than a percent of Kalamazoo's population, took home one reusable container per week. So not very many people, and we could still save 30,000 disposable containers from landfills. Now Justin can talk about how this fits into our plan. Yeah, very briefly. Yeah, so as the community sustainability plan states, um, I guess step back. As the sustainability planner, my job is to oversee the community sustainability plan. Uh, for Kalamazoo, the community sustainability plan has a goal of moving towards a green circular economy. A lot of that is moving away from single use plastics or anything, right? So a program like this falls in line um, with kind of what we want to promote in the city. 
as far as our community sustainability plan goes. Um, that's why we were brought in Alexa and Alexa took this on as her project and here we are. So yeah, not much to say beyond that. Just broadly speaking, we want to see waste reduced in the city and how the city can help that. We're trying to figure that out with Alexa. And so now, Natasha, you can give your spiel about whatever it is and everything. All right. Can you see my screen? <clears throat> Almost. Okay. So we'll give that a second. Um, again, I'm Natasha Gaffer. I'm CEO of Foreverware. Um, and we've been around for about four years um, getting businesses in the food service industry up and running with reusables. We primarily work with companies that offer um, food that is eaten off-site. So, for example, we wouldn't work um, necessarily with a school for, like, um, reusable trays that they use for dine-in. Um, and I just kind of back backtrack just a little bit here. We talk a lot about plastic food packaging. And it really has a bad reputation for ending up in the environment. But plastic itself isn't the problem that we're here to talk about. It's single use that's the problem. When we exchange one single use packaging option for another, whether it's plastic, compostable, aluminum, it requires more forest, more metals, agricultural processes, all with significant impacts on climate, air, water quality, and public health. Um, these are a few of the headlines that we're seeing about chemicals that leach from single-use packaging into our food. Um, they're, they're pretty scary, and a lot of people um, don't know a whole lot about PFAS and the chemicals that are coming from our packaging. Um, so the now that you've seen this, maybe you'll see it a little bit more in the news. Um, smart brands have caught wind of this. Uh, Starbucks, Nestle, Pepsi, and many others have made progress towards their commitments to go zero waste or offer 100% reusable packaging by 2027. And Foreverware is making the technology behind reusable packaging programs available across the U.S., not just to these giant brands, but to businesses of all sizes. And we've designed a way to do it that will save businesses money. So Foreverware equips businesses with everything that's needed to offer reusable packaging, including two devices, one for employees to check containers out to consumers. It's kind of like checking out a book at the library and a self-return station where consumers can check them back in. Uh, the process looks a little bit different for each type of business, which I'll talk more about in just a minute here. So from the consumer's perspective, um, Let's see, do I have another slide in here? Maybe that's it. Uh, the consumers continue to order like they normally do. So online, in person, over the phone or self-serve. And before they take the containers to go, staff check the containers out to the consumer using the Foreverware app by scanning a code on the container. I think you can see that here on the top of the mugs in the photo. And they associate the order to the customer phone number or a credit card. And for cafeterias, we can integrate with student IDs and staff IDs. We have a number of different ways that you can check the containers out. So what we're talking here is kind of like your, your library card, a way to kind of associate the containers to the user. Um, customers pay a $5 refundable deposit the first time that they order or leave a credit card on file that can be charged if the containers are not returned. Consumers don't have to download an app to participate, but we do have an optional app where they can see uh, what containers are checked out and opt in for reminders if they want to. Um, we also have uh, a way if universities or corporate cafeterias are interested, um, we can do scan a QR code that associates with their badge, some things like that inside of our consumer app. Uh, then when the consumer is ready to order again, they simply return the containers at any self-return station in the Foreverware network in exchange for clean containers each time that they order. The containers get scanned back into the system by the consumer at the self-return station or be by staff before washing. So this is kind of where like the system varies a little bit depending on the type of business that you own. And we love having those conversations one-on-one -on -one with businesses to help them figure out what the process looks like. But the important part here is that we've made it really easy for the consumers by giving the businesses the tools that they need to have control of the customer experience. 
And our system works well, uh, not just for restaurants and coffee shops, but for higher ed, corporate cafeterias, food halls, commissary kitchens, ghost kitchens, hot and cold bars, and many more. The only requirement to participate is that businesses work out of a licensed commercial kitchen and have a Wi-Fi connection. So um, food trucks, for example, they would need to have um, a commercial space where they can wash the containers. Because participating businesses wash reusable takeaway containers on site with a commercial dishwasher or a three compartment sink, just like they do for dine-in plates and cups, any business or city can get started today using their existing infrastructure. Um, we make it really easy by pre-packaging everything that's needed to get started and deliver or ship it. We include educational displays and posters. We have a staff training video in our app. We provide the two devices that I that I mentioned earlier, one for staff to check the containers out, a second for consumers to check them in. We also offer uh, customer support as well as the containers. Foreverware has five styles of food containers uh, and beverage containers in stock that can be shipped to customers as needed, uh, to customers being the businesses. So on the left here in the picture are the containers that we offer, and then on the right, there are some additional options. Um, so you don't have to use our containers. Um, let's see. We have five styles of food and beverage containers in stock. Businesses are also welcome to purchase and use almost any reusable container, which we can help source and brand um, as needed. So a branded container could work really well for a university or a corporate, ca uh, corporate um, campus. And each container has a tracking label, which we provide. The labels are, of course, dishwasher safe. I get that question all the time. The cost to offer reusables is often less than disposable options, sometimes 80% less for businesses that switch entirely to reusables. Foreverware charges a flat monthly fee starting at $25 a month per device plus five cents each time a container is checked out to a customer. And this is typically less than the cost of a single use container, which on average comes in around uh, 16 to 60 cents per unit. So compared to the five cents, you really can save quite a bit depending on your volume. Uh, Foreverware containers are free to use with a $5 refundable deposit. And since Foreverware doesn't sell the containers, we basically lease them. We take care of replacing or recycling the damaged containers, sourcing new containers as needed, and can ship them to businesses in small batches, and they can move freely between the business. So there's many uh, benefits to having the containers owned by the system. Um, and then alternatively, for like a university, there are benefits to owning them as well. Um, here's how you can reach me. You can visit our website at foreverware.org to learn more. Uh, businesses can sign up on our website via our For Businesses page. Um, if there are any advocates that end up watching this uh, video um, and you want to help get businesses onboarded, you can reach out. Uh, via our contact form to set up a conversation with our team. Uh, we're also raising money. So if you want to invest in the future of reuse, uh, you can reach out to me that way as well. And feel free to email me with questions. I think my email is right here at the bottom, Natasha foreverware.org. Are there any specific questions or any Alexa that you've that you want me to answer? Um, gosh, I think you hit on a lot of the things that we had questions on the survey a while ago. Um, do you have any questions that you can think of off the top of your head as our, yeah. our sole business? Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay, my biggest question is, we purchase for everywhere, is that what we do? We purchase it? So you lease the containers from us, um, we ship them to you. If at any point the system doesn't work for you and you want to end your reuse program, you can ship them back to us and we'll give you a refund. So you basically use our containers for a $5 refundable deposit. Okay, so, okay. And then when people bring them back into you, then I don't want to be washing the dishes. They need to come back to you. Is that something that each individual shop decides? Like, what if they bring that container to use again? 
I'm not going to be wide in Washington. That's going to cost them too much money. They have the employees to do that. So if they bring it in clean, we can do that. That's so that's businesses that participate in uh, reuse programs that are powered by Foreverwear do washing themselves. And we have the research that shows that businesses won't lose money on the washing part. It actually adds very, very little to the cost of offering a reuse program to do the washing. And I can provide some additional resources um, to read up on that if you'd like. So you're saying that when they bring it back in, we have to wash them? Yep, so businesses wash the containers, yep. Did you think that maybe 10 people brought in a cup and a bowl? That's you just took it as you wish it. Yeah, okay. All right, so the question the answer. Mm -hmm. That's what the right. You guys, anyone else think of anything that questions on the Cool. All right. Well, thank you, Natasha. One second. Sorry, I'm I'm not there, but uh, I have a question. Um, Natasha, do you have data on since people are scanning in to kind of like rent one of these containers? Mm -hmm. Do you have data on how many individual customers you have versus how many repeat containers? Like, uh, for example, does one per like do you do you track like one person has rented slash bought uh, eight different containers? Uh, yeah, and we make that data accessible to you as well. So we track everything down to. Um, like how many checkouts you had, how many returns, how many new and return customers you had. And then based on the data, we also do calculations. So how long have your containers been checked out? How long is it taking them to get returned? Um, the cycle rate. So how long are your containers sitting on the shelf? What is your quantity of inventory? We have several different data points. And we often see like, um, depending on how many days of the week that you're open, it, it can vary a little bit, but we have some coffee shops that have super users that have used the system thousands of times and they're using it every day. We see it in a scenario of like a coffee shop, consumers come back daily or weekly, whereas like with restaurants, there's more of like a weekly, monthly type of flow. So there's more of a benefit of having like a cluster of businesses when it comes to restaurants. But when we talk about coffee shops, consumer behavior is that they visit or frequent a coffee shop on a regular basis. So it works really well in that application. Um, another kind of thing I was thinking about, because um, Alec has a bakery, is we work with a company that has a walk-up window and they're open a limited number of days a week. And so this can also work for like a drive through or walk-up window type of situation. Um, and we basically meet with each business to talk through the process and what it looks like for your specific scenario. Okay. Because um, I, I can, I'm trying to, imagine the uh, impetus customers would have to bring them back and reuse them versus like reusable bags at a grocery store that almost all the time just end up in people's trunks of their car and not mm -hmm. ever actually reused. And I was curious if you are able to track that and see that, okay, once a customer rents one of these containers, it's reused time and time and time and again, or is it a customer rents a container, it kind of, lives with them for a period of time they rent another one it lives with them for a period of time they rent another one and then maybe they bring one back or something like that yeah we can see all of that so how many times each container is getting used um that data is all available to us like, and what, what is that typically so it varies based on how long the programs have been open and how many days a week they're open as well um i think it like it's literally different for every business because they're so varied um yeah. well, I mean, but the idea is like you could use one container for multiple businesses right 
Yeah, we haven't seen as much movement of the containers between the businesses. Oh, okay. um, even like, so for example, we have two coffee shops in Chicago in the same neighborhood. They're roughly like, mm, like yeah, like maybe they're 10 blocks away or something. We still don't see a lot of movement between those. We have seen some like the cafe is closed on a Monday. So there's very few customers that will like visit somewhere downtown with that same container, but we don't see a ton of movement of the containers between the businesses at this point. Okay. Yeah, it's for that, um, I'm hoping to see some movement between the containers in Kalamazoo, given that we're like a smaller city and our advertising is going to be hopefully cohesive with all of these, these businesses listed as participants. So I'm wondering if, if we'll get some different data out of that and that could be really interesting. And if we don't, that could also be interesting to learn. Yeah. Especially for food containers. Um, having like a cluster of businesses close together. So this week you get takeout from this business in the same neighborhood, then you borrow from the next business. So the closer they are together, the more uh, movement we see between them. Yeah, we have an opportunity with um, the places that are looking at this because they are all in walking distance. So, Perfect. Um, yeah. And then I would like to speak to the reusables just because that's what I do. Um, every person who comes into our store, they bring back their reusables. And so um, I know there's questions and it can be new, especially on the food side of things, but um, seeing people bring back reusables daily, hundreds of people uh, weekly, um, I know that it can be done. We have a large community with uh, the community that comes into my shop which is right next to all my neighbors here at um, the farmer's market. Um, we have a huge community that these people get it and they are really waiting for this. Um, everyone that I've talked to about this in my store has been thrilled and excited to um, frequent the places that are participating, which that equates to more sales. Um, so you're reaching a new group of people then if they're like, no, I would rather choose this place over this place because they're doing something that I believe in. I think that's really neat. Yep. I'm one of those people too. So I shop at a local food co-op and I bring my jars and my containers with me and I just, I fill them up. Uh, they weigh them at the counter, subtract the tear weight, and then I'm off with all loose produce and bulk goods, no packaging except for dairy. Dairy is hard to get um, unpackaged, but yep, I hear you. I'm among those people. <laughs> yeah, I'll, ask, I'll add a thing to that as well. Um, I tabled at our local farmer's market this past weekend and um, brought some flyers about Forever Wear and was spreading the word a little bit, telling everybody like, hey, this is coming soon. Like, here's how it works. And there was I mean, a lot of people that came up and were very interested. Granted, that's probably the right crowd of folks to to hit, but lots of people seem to be gaining some excitement and they're asking when and where and how can they get involved. So pretty pretty exciting stuff that we have some interest. I, in I, I really like the uh, community aspect of it. And Kalamazoo is definitely that kind of vibe where that will thrive in, because particularly getting people i i'm positive we will get more customers from this that are just like oh i'm so glad you're participating in this like i have this reusable container i went to your bakery because you're participating in this this is fantastic like i didn't go to jimmy john's i went to, i went here to get my sandwich because i got my reusable container i am positive that that will be <laughs> like like we'll see that uh, i don't know how much we'll see it or uh, to put an exact number on, but I'm thinking of it from that aspect. Uh, I'm kind of excited about it, but um, I'm definitely curious about like if we could, if you have the data for it, I would love to see it of like how many people are essentially how many of these containers do you lose uh, to customers? I can and, like, bring up a quick. 
I can bring up a quick case study just to show something. Um, let me make this bigger. And then, oh, I lost it. Studies. How do I zoom in? I can pull it over to my, oh, I'm still sharing my screen. Perfect. So if I can zoom in on this. Ah, there we go. So this is a coffee shop case study, and um, there's data here for both 40 weeks and 58 weeks. And you can see this kind of yellow trend line is the program growing slowly over time. And then we're, we're seeing on here, the blue line is their number of checkouts. And the, um, oh, I don't have, do I have returns on here? Total usage, uh, transactions. So transactions are like the, up at the register, checkouts are the number of containers they got. So there could be multiple checkouts per transaction. And then um, total usage, active customers. So um, interestingly, over time, um, the new customer line will go down over time as the market gets saturated. Um, and we'll see it kind of like is steady if you're in an area where there's consistently new customers coming in and sometimes going up. Um, but we do see some seasonal fluctuation, fluctuation also. But this orange line over time, it's pretty stable here. Um, let's see, what can I call out in here? So let's just stick to this top one. So a median of 15 customers stopped in twice a week and checked out a mug or two. 160, 106 mugs were supplied. So they used both um, 12 and 16 ounce mugs. So you need more uh, mugs when you have two sizes, just to make sure you don't run out. Um, 1,200 total container reuses, uh, 1023 total transactions, uh, 70 customers signed up, eight customers checked out containers one time, 62 customers checked out containers more than once, 30 more than 10 times, 16 more than 20 times, and two customers more than 100 times, just over the 40 weeks. Um, for the 58 week duration, this is just like, I just recompiled the data after some time. Um, they spent about 39 cents per use in this scenario. And keep in mind that this cafe or this coffee shop offers the reusables as an option, it's not required. So alongside disposable options. In comparison, if we look down here at this one, so the top was a coffee shop, this is a cafe. The cost per use for this one, which is exclusively reusables, they paid about 12 cents per use. So this is kind of like averaging out the cost that they pay to us plus that five cents um, and what it ended up costing them. So this one is 66 week duration. They're open seven days a week, six, uh, seven hours a day for six days a week, sorry. They only offer the 16 ounce mug, so their inventory is gonna be a little bit smaller than the last one. They had 11,000 checkouts for about 10,000 transactions. Uh, similar amount of returns here. So you can see um, checkouts compared to returns. Now, some of these containers are still checked out, obviously, and are expected to come back, but you can kind of do a little math here on the difference. There were 2,000 unique customers, and I'm just rounding these. We provided about 2,000 containers. So here you can also see there were, you know, about 11,000 checkouts and we gave them 2,000. They paid a total of, you know, $1,300, which is about 12 cents per reuse. And then here's the chart over time. So here's that trend line of new customers going down over time as they kind of saturate the market. But this is a lot. This is by week so that this particular cafe has about you know 26 new customers a week here that are using foreverware. And then um, here we have like, you can see some dips for like holidays when they're closed, but overall like really great participation. We're getting some spikes in like the summer months when there are um, events and stuff going on in the area and then other like little dips around like holidays and things going on. Any questions about this data? Yeah. Um, trying to math this out, would you say like a good way to look at 
you know, uh, missing containers would be looking at the container checkouts versus the container returns. Like if yeah. that container hasn't been returned yet, you yeah. could say like, it's still out there. Yeah, minus probably a return period. So if it was checked out five minutes ago, I wouldn't expect oh, it to come yeah. back yet. Just and you could a, you could kind of put like whatever time period um, in place. So let's say you'd expect them to return them within three days. You would subtract that from this checkout about what you'd expect. And then what's left over would be kind of like the the loss or it's like been that. checked out longer than we expected. Yeah. Gotcha. You can find like a percentage by taking the container returns and divide it by the number of checkouts. Yep, exactly. Okay. Yeah, and we do some of this math now. I don't have it in this chart, but we have um, uh, in our analytics tool, we have those charts available. Cool. What's your I'm overall gonna... thought on this? Like, is this kind of neat to see? Um, I'm definitely uh, interested in it. Um, the containers I really like. I like those, the metal ones a lot. Um, mm -hmm. The longevity, basically a container that's going to last a long time, I think is what's going to be really appealing to people who are concerned about conservation. And they don't want a reusable container that's just going to degrade in a couple of weeks or break or go missing after a few uses i think people um I th well i mean maybe not i don't i have no idea what people think but i think that something that has a lot of longevity is obviously going to be more reusable than something that's going to break after a little bit and so yeah those metal containers seem really nice for that yeah for sure and they they do have some nice properties you know they don't leak in the in the car and they hold heat a little bit longer there's various features that are quite nice as well. Yeah, I did fill up all the containers with water and aggressively shake it around, and the water did I was very impressed. <laughs> the one thing that I have been sharing with people is that um, obviously the waste is huge, right? We don't want you know the foam and the plastic and all of that going to landfills. But the other piece of it is that. We have such amazing restaurants and cafes and all of the, the food places that are down here that are making amazing food. It's lovely. It's high quality. It's all of those things. But then when we're putting it in plastic, because it's the norm, this is what we're used to. Now we're putting all of those chemicals onto all of that good food, you know? And so anytime that we can cut that down, I just think that's important. Um, people don't think about that. You know, we're eating a credit card's worth of plastic a week. And it's because of our food packaging. It's because of the air. It's, it's just everywhere. And I think that's one piece of that. And that's why I love the, I love the metal. Like the, uh, it's safe. It's do you have um, a policy of what happens to these containers um, over time um, in terms of you taking them back if they start degrading? What happens to them then? Are they recycled there? Or are they thrown away after that point? Um, the company is pretty young, right? Yeah, we've been around for about four years, so we've seen containers go through hundreds of cycles, but we haven't hit thousands yet. Um, some of them, I'd imagine, will hit those numbers and it will be fine. Uh, the stainless steel actually performs really well over time. I don't know, you know, if you have a water bottle or something that's stainless steel that's unpainted, it actually looks nice for quite a long time. Um, oh, yeah. But yeah, the idea is that the the five cent fee um, and the service fees that we're charging are meant to maintain the fleet. And so we would take them back for recycling. Um, businesses do cover shipping costs. Um, so that is something to factor in too. But we will take um, anything back for recycling. We'll replace any that are damaged um, and we'll maintain that fleet over time. 
Wait, assume that there is a white sheet of how much it would cost to get started. For instance, or you know, dozens or whatever, and then you have a suggested retail for what you would sell that for. Um, in a suggested, it's being long and coming back. We have those those price points. Like so, price. businesses that offer a reuse program, if they want to use the containers that we offer from our inventory. Pay a five dollar refundable deposit up front. That's the cost that the business pays, and then you turn around and you um, borrow those to your consumers for a five dollar refundable deposit. And then whenever those containers get returned to the business or to Foreverware, the refund is issued for five dollars. So the five dollar deposit isn't meant for anyone to make a profit. Profit. It's just meant as an incentive to make sure the containers come back to the system. And if they don't, the cost of the container is covered. That's pretty good incentive to get five dollars back. Yeah. So okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Any more questions? All right. Well, then we'll move into our next section here, which is. I'm going to drop order. off Alexa. Thank you so much. Thank you, Natasha. All right. Bye. Thank you. Bye. All right. So, yeah, we'll move into our support for businesses now. So, um, we want to help support reusable takeout containers for our businesses downtown in Kalamazoo um, to get this program rolling and hope help create a more sustainable city. So we were awarded $9,000 by the WS and Lois Van Dalsen Foundation. Um, and so that $9,000 is going towards this program, which is really exciting. So I made a little chart here to, to describe where that money flows to. So $750 of that um, 9,000 will be used towards City of Kalamazoo stickers for branding and any miscellaneous fees. So our vision for these containers is that we'll have a little sticker that says like City of Kalamazoo on it, just to show our support um, in the, the containers. And then the other um, 8,250 will be used to fund up to 15 food establishments who are interested in participating. So that would cover, um, Natasha mentioned the startup cost and then the monthly software fees. So the way we're uh, breaking this up is it would cover your initial startup cost, which is a one-time fee of $400, which is $200 per device. And there's two devices. Like she had mentioned, there's the checkout device um, for the business and then the check-in device for your consumers. So we would cover that initial fee. And then the other um, part we would cover is $150 of software fees, which is equivalent to three months. Um, so for each of those two devices, um, Natasha charges $25 Per month per device for the, the software. And so put that together, that's $50 a month. We're going to do three months. Um, does that make sense? Any questions on funding? Okay. So, with us covering that cost, the remaining investment that uh, a business would need to make into this would be that $5 per container lease that Natasha was talking about. So, that's the thing that you would pay up front to get the containers shipped to you. And so each business could decide however many containers they want. If you want 10, if you want 100, if you want 3,000, you would pay $5 per container and pay that shipping cost as well. Um, and then anytime, if, if you decide to opt out of the program, you could return those containers and get that deposit back. And then there's the five cents per use fee that Natasha mentioned as well. And then after that three months, um, that software fee would then fall to the business of fifty dollars per month. So the process to um, to get this funding would first be uh, connecting with Foreverware to get your business added to the network. So that would be meeting um, with Natasha to talk through what would best work for your particular establishment, um, and that would be paying that container lease the startup fee and prepay for three months of the software fees up front. So by doing that, that makes it easy for us to uh, reimburse you for the startup fee and the software fees. 
So after you connect with Natasha, then you'll want to apply for a variance with the health department, which Chris will talk about what that looks like. And then we have a couple forms uh, for the city to get your reimbursement. And so those are just the W-9 and then the EFT form, which is um, pretty much a, a direct deposit form. And then, so once you have the variance and those forms filled out and you have a forever wear receipt, you're gonna submit those to Justin there. Um, and then we'll get that reimbursement to you through our accounting system. And I was told it should take about three weeks to get that money. Any questions about funding? Awesome. So um, because we are located right downtown next to all of our restaurant and cafe neighbors, um, we are really excited to help everybody. Um, so we would be the primary contact point um, if people needed different containers. So let's say that um, you brought in a container, you got a container from him, right? And then you brought it back to somewhere else to drop it off because even though Natasha hasn't seen that, I feel like once this gets off the ground, we will see them. Everyone is such a close proximity with each other. Mm -hmm. And so that could mean that now you don't have your 50 containers. Sherry has 80 and you don't have what you need. And you're going to be like, hey, I need more. And so we would be that contact person to just send a text to and say, we need 20 small rectangles. I'll be like, I let me get those over to you. And then we'll manage that to get you what you need to keep you at your levels. Um, so, and I know that there's going to be the question of, well, that's what I bought and that's what I need. And we all just need to, I think, have some grace as this program gets up and off the ground to figure things out um, because this is kind of like the, the beta testing of this. Um, we are going to use our platform um, through Be Joyful um, to promote and educate the community um, whether that is through the store, just conversations that we have uh, through our website, social media, and um, just talking with uh, people that are downtown um, through our events to let people know um, why we're doing this, all of that. And those people who are in the program are then going to get extra advertising for their business, which I think is fantastic. Um, Again, just talking about uh, sustainability is our life. And so this is, um, you know, sharing why this is important. And then um, also looking at maybe a place that we would be able to be a drop off if somebody were just coming in because we do, those are our people. And so they might have a container with them and the restaurants might not be open because we can um, kind of foresee that happening. Restaurants, not all of them open at like Sherry's open morning, but all of my restaurant neighbors, they don't open until four. So if someone comes downtown, they found a parking and they made it to our store, um, they might have a container with the places that open so they could drop it off with us. Um, we'll get it sanitized and then disperse them back out to whoever needs them. So, we're very excited to, to help everybody to work through this. Um, change is hard, um, and we're here to be uh, an advocate for this and to make it happen. Mm -hmm. I would be easy. Mm -hmm. to you would just give those, and that's okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. brings back these to me, mm -hmm. then I give them. Then you would just text me. I tell them something. Mm -hmm. Alec, do you have any questions? Not a ton, just, you know, things to mull over. Um, yeah. All right. We'll move along then. This is time to shine. Yeah. <laughs> you can. Oh, okay. So um, under the our current code, the 2009 Michigan Modified Code, 
the reusable takeout containers, containers are actually not allowed. So to get around this, we're going to issue a variance to use the science from the newest 2017 code that Michigan will hopefully be adopting in the next year. Um, so to do this, I have a pre-filled variance request form that um, uh, the, any interested restaurant can get from either myself or from Alexa. And um, you just fill out the top with who you are and you sign at the bottom. And then there's a standard operating procedure that goes with that, that describes and outlines what will need to be done in order to uh, participate. So those items are, uh, so th this is just verbatim from the procedure, but the uh, the containers used have to be the containers that are approved by this uh, reusable takeout container program. So the forever wear containers, uh, they must be provided to the customer by a food establishment participating in the program. They would need to be returned by the customer to a food establishment participating in the program or to um, a designated drop-off site like be joyful. Um, and then the food establishment has to make sure they have adequate space to properly store and air dry the containers and lids. So that'll be something to consider when um, determining how many you need. And then uh, once returned and prior to being filled with the food or beverage, the containers and lids must be washed, rinsed, and sanitized and air dried like all other utensils used by the food establishment. So nothing new or different there. Um, and then they must be visually inspected by a food employee to ensure that the container and the lids are in good repair. Um, so you're looking for um, making sure that they're smooth and uh, smooth, smooth and easily cleanable with cracks, ribs, holes, and so on and so forth. Um, if you find that they're not in good repair, um, Natasha mentioned that they can be returned to her, um, but they won't be able to be used and you'll have to use others that are in good repair. Um, and then if uh, excess containers are transferred from one food establishment to another by Be Joyful, um, you'll have to reclean and sanitize those new containers that you received um, assuming that they may have become soil along the way. So the variance request forms can be sent to myself. You can give me a call with any questions. Um, and if you are an MDARD inspected and licensed facility, you should reach out to either Josh Kristiniak, uh, one of the MDARD inspectors for our area, or if you have someone else, you can reach out to them and his information is there on the screen. And you have connected with him. Uh, yes, they are aware of the business. Any questions? Um, general question. I can't seem to see the uh, document that you're all looking at right now. Um, it just says like it's unavailable. Uh, could that be emailed to me later on? Yeah, um, I'll stop sharing and reshare also. But it will be emailed to you, yes. Okay, cool. Thank you. It looks like it's thinking. Do you see it? Uh, no, uh, at one point I had like the ability to click on a PDF uh, file, but that is gone now. Um, it's it's I'm following along pretty okay right now. I was just wanting to be able to go back and look at this when I talked to yeah. me and my coworkers around it about it. A lot of people are pretty cool. excited about it. I want to have yes. something um, to show. Them. Sure. <laughs> All right. Um, then we'll move into our last section, which is just our little wrap up of all this information. Um, so one thing that I wanted to point out is that reusable takeout containers are not the only solution and they don't have to operate uh, on their own. So other ways you can help uh, make your establishment more sustainable is by avoiding styrofoam, integrating some compostable containers and encouraging customers to bring their own containers and cups as well. Um, 
I'm sure there's many other ways as well, but I just wanted to highlight that, that reusable takeout containers aren't the only answer. <laughs> and they're not gonna work for every business either. So if it doesn't work for your establishment, that's okay. There's other ways forward as well. So just as a reminder, these are the next couple of steps we have. So uh, step one is to decide if Foreverware is right for your business. And that is through talking with Natasha and, and figuring out a plan forward. Um, if you do decide to add your business to the Foreverware network, then you'll want to order your materials, obtain that uh, health code variance. And then uh, once you get the health code variance and a receipt from Foreverware, uh, you'll want to fill out the W-9 and that EFT form and submit to Justin so we can get your reimbursement back to you as soon as possible. If you take those four steps of submitting, uh, joining the February Network and then submitting those couple of papers by June 14th, then we'll include you in a press release and advertising through the city to help um, get your business some customers with this February program and uh, help promote it as much as we can. And we'll also be doing some tabling throughout the summer um, as well. So we'll be sure to, to highlight your business at that tabling too. And then the last slide I have here is just all of our, our contact information. Um, so mine, Justin's, Natasha, Chris, and Jess is all up there. Um, and these will all be sent to you as well. Um, but following this meeting, I'll be sending um, an email with a recording of, of this whole meeting, um, a guide for businesses to get involved that I put together and kind of the step-by-step -step process and what it looks like for your consumers, what that cost looks like. I'll send the PowerPoint as well. And I have a compiled document that has all of the necessary forms in one place for you to be able to fill out easily. So yeah, that's that's all we got for reusable containers. So if there's any last minute questions, um, feel free to, to share them. But if not, thank you guys for, for coming today and learning more. And hopefully we can uh, get this program off the ground pretty soon. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, I've got kind of a random question about compostable compostables in Kalamazoo. Are there facilities in Kalamazoo? Like, is our um, landfill able to break down compostable goods? It's adjusting. It's on. Yeah, landfill, landfill break down anything. Uh, the goal with the compostable materials is that we keep out of landfill and get it to an industrial compost facility. That's something that we don't have in the area. Um, so, yeah, so no. <laughs> well, there's, there's compostable though, and there's industrial compostable. But when it comes to some of these containers, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. You know what I mean? Like the plastic ones that say, "Oh, this is compostable and it's got a green leaf on it," but then on the back it's like industrial compostable facilities only. Yeah. But then you have a compostable takeout container that, if I threw that in my compost, that's going to break down. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yep. So yeah. So. The the compostable kind of papery stuff will break down. When they say industrial compostable facility, it's the same techniques. It's just the temperatures just get a little bit higher. So yeah, you could throw your compostable takeout container into your compost. It'll break down. It might take a while to break down. I still pull out some of mine. That fork will probably never break down because your pile's never going to get hot enough. Um, for an industrial compost facility, you're looking at piles of 140 to 160 degrees for months, maybe. Um, so it just kind of everything will break down. Uh, but yeah, so with compost materials, if it just goes in a landfill, it's the same as throwing anything else into a landfill. It's going to break down in an anaerobic environment. It's going to create methane. Um, Alexa knew what she was doing. She threw it to me because I just started spiraling all this stuff. <laughs> so yeah, did that answer a question? Maybe not the question you asked, but... <laughs> yes and no. Um, so yeah, I guess no. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we're recording. I start to fly up the cuts and methods. So I don't think that um, if you're going to provide compostable material or compostable packaging and throw it in a landfill, it, I don't think there's any win there. Um, so you have to you have to compost it, compost it at the end. Um, and without an industrial compost facility or like good composting infrastructure around here, I generally shy away from pushing compostable containers. They can cost more, and um, unless you're like Hop Cat or Bells, who has My Green Michigan pick up their compost and their waste and then they take it to an industrial facility 
Um, and we say industrial facility, you're talking about a farm with giant windrows. It's not super complex. Um, did that make it a little bit more clear? Yeah. Less? Um, I mean, it's a complicated situation. It's kind of like purchasing an electric vehicle despite it running on coal, but you're still kind of, by purchasing it, moving the market forward. And so the idea of purchasing compostable containers is theoretically moving the market into a better direction than if you were to continue to purchase non-compostable containers. But I guess, yeah, I guess. if you're looking at some plastics, probably, yeah, so if you ship that way. Um, I just think the end goal is to get stuff composted, and it's a shame that we can't seem to get it composted at the end. Yeah, but, yeah. okay. I, I'm, I'm understanding what you're saying about Kalamazoo's limitations, though. The one last thing um, that I forgot to mention too is I have samples of all of the Foreverware containers at the Community Planning and Economic Development Office. Um, so if any participating establishments want to see and touch the containers and um, figure out if they think they'd be right or not before they um, uh, decide to participate, feel free to reach out to me and um, we can get these samples floating around so you can take a look at them and, and see what would work for you. Well, with that, thank you all. I'll stop the recording now. Thank you as well. Yeah. Cool. Well, thanks for joining, Alec. We'll see you later. Yes.